Almost two years ago, while experimenting with the effects of composite methods on resolving faint detail within an image, I noticed that inverting the polarity of light in an image, and the equivalent of creating a digital negative, not only helped reveal dark hidden structures within a nebula, but it also further revealed the subtleties, the textures and the shades and even the dimensionality of those structures. For example, the image that you're looking at right now is an image that I shot just two nights ago of the Flame Nebula, NGC 2024. I apologize for the present condition of this image. It needs probably about eight more hours of integration for it to really be good. And the fuzziness that you're seeing is because I was only able to get under three hours of integration two nights ago when I shot this. Still, it makes the point, if you look closely at the dark material within the Flame Nebula, you can see that it's practically silhouetted into black obscurity by the contrasting brightness of the ionized material within the nebula. Which is a shame, because there is a tremendous amount of structure, a tremendous amount of detail, and likewise a great deal of beauty to be revealed with thin. A simple technique will reveal that underlying structure. All that has to be done is the stars pulled with a tool such as the Star Exterminator, then save and export the new image as a lossless TIFF, and then, in a layer-based photo editor such as Affinity Photo, open up a Curves tool and invert the Curves tool like this. In this simple way, a digital negative has been created in which all the light polarities are reversed. But, notice something else has happened. Not only is the dark material better showing up as white, we get a much clearer impression of its form and structure throughout the much more eye-catching, brighter ionized material. And there is something beyond even that. Inverting the light polarity in this way also shows us the subtle shades, hues, densities, and transparencies of the dark material better. When I first noticed this phenomenon when I was developing an image of a dark nebula over a year ago, my immediate thought was, how can I apply this to developing the next image? Let's take a look at how. It's not difficult. However, to do it, to my knowledge, you cannot accomplish this in a photo editor such as Cyril or PixInsight. You're going to need a layer-based photo editor. I use Affinity Photo. If you use something like GIMP, I'm sure you can do it there. And the same with Photoshop. The reason being is you have to break up the image into layers and then be able to carefully and precisely control how the information from each layer is composited into the next layer. So in PixInsight, I've created an RGB layer and a luminance layer. I never combine these layers in PixInsight because, frankly, I get much more precision combination of information by doing the compositing in a layer-based photo editor. I'll begin preparing this image by dragging in the RGB layer. And now I'm going to drag in this blue layer. Please ignore that blue layer. That was for another experiment I was doing. Um, I'm just going to skip past all this stuff, but you're going to notice that blue layer over here on the right as well. Just pretend that doesn't exist throughout the rest of this video. That was for a different experiment that I was doing in applying specific light frequencies to enhance information. Maybe we'll cover that in a different video. But now I've just dragged in the luminance layer. I've made the blue layer invisible, so it's not going to affect our results for now. And I'm going to composite the luminance layer to the RGB layer by using the luminosity composite mode. Now I'm going to sharpen the discrete information, first by frequency splitting the luminance layer into its high and low frequency components. I'll rename each layer LHF and LLF for luminance high frequency and luminance low frequency. And once that's done, I'll use the synergistic sharpening technique that I've covered in previous videos to sharpen up all the luminance high frequency information. Then I'll frequency split the RGB information, rename it in the same way, and apply synergistic sharpening to the high frequency RGB information. Once the high frequency information from both the luminance and RGB layers is improved, I'll open the levels tool in the luminance and RGB layers and use it to discreetly brighten the R, G, and B channels, the master channel which brightens all of them together, and also use the levels tool to discreetly increase the black point just slightly and tighten the gamma, which will constrict the appearance of stray light, which helps to improve the contrast and the appearance of the structures within the image.
Now it's not time yet to apply the star plate to the image, but having it in the layer stack can be useful because when the star layer is screened into the rest of the image, it can clean up the appearance a little bit and it may be useful to turn it on from time to time to see what the final image will look like. So I'll put the star layer in there, set it for the screen composite mode, and then a little later in the next editing steps, I'll turn it off for a while. Now I want to brighten the information even further. At first, I was going to do that with the Curves tool by placing the Curves tool over both the Luminance and the RGB layers, but I decided Curves wasn't the best way to do it. So I switched over to the Levels tool once again, which is like an extremely precise but far more powerful version of the Curves tool. I should really do a separate video on how to use the Levels tool because it's an absolutely amazing and often neglected tool among astrophotographers, but it is one of the keys to the ways that I make astrophotography and I consider it indispensable. In a nutshell, you can use the drop down menu to decide whether you want to work on the red, green, or blue channels or the master channel, which affects all the channels directly and together. Pulling down the white slider increases the brightness of everything in the image. Pulling up the black slider increases the dimness threshold that it takes illumination to show up within the image. And the gamma slider is also a very powerful tool on the levels tool. If it is slid up, light has to pass a certain value of luminosity in order to appear within the image, making it very powerful at removing stray light, such as moonlight, or helping certain structures to stand out within an image. Now, having adjusted the overall brightness, I see that this is also raising the brightness of the star on attack on the lower right side too much, but I can easily paint out the effects of the levels tool on that star just by selecting the paintbrush on the left and the black color, and painting over the star, which removes the effects of the Levels tool from that area. Now this is a pretty true LRGB version of the Flame Nebula. Now, with the stars turned off, I'm going to right click on one of the layers and select Merge Visible to make a new single pixel layer out of all the visible information, including the corrections. In a moment, I'll export that as a lossless TIFF into Photolab 8, where I'll make precise luminance and color corrections and enhance the sharpness even further. And if you watched my last video on how to kill noise, then you're aware of what I'm doing here. On this new merge pixel layer, which contains all the information and edits I've done in Affinity Photo, I'm just running the noise exterminator one last time before sending it to Photolab 8. Because even though I denoised the information early on back in PixInsight, the editing process will bring out any residual noise that still happens to be within the image. Running the denoiser one last time on the final merged image before exporting to Photolab 8 gets rid of that residual noise so we can get better outcomes in the final editing. Now we're in Photolab 8. This video isn't really about Photolab 8. I'll just briefly give a synopsis on what I'm going to do here. I'm going to apply some of Photolab 8's special features such as its smart lighting and its Clearview Plus tools to enhance the lighting throughout the image and clarify its sharpness and contrast. In addition, I'll use Photolab 8's very powerful fine and micro contrast adjustment in conjunction with its special unsharp mask tool to further resolve the high frequency information beyond what can be done alone with the Blur Exterminator in PixInsight. Now, I'm sure you'll notice that even then this image remains a little blurry, or at least blurrier than I would like, and that's because the image lacks integration. This image is made of less than three hours of information. That was all the good information that I could get out of a very terrible but otherwise clear night. I do plan to add about another eight hours of integration to this image at the next opportunity. And that should resolve a lot more fine detail within the image. I'm also going to use Photolab 8's very powerful selective color adjustment tools to try to make the best of the color that is showing here and its local adjustment tools to keep the very bright regions of the flame nebula near the center here from becoming blown out while adjusting the dimmer regions of the flame on the outskirts. The ability of Photolab 8 to select specific regions of an image based on color, brightness, darkness, or spatial region makes this photo editor extremely powerful. Right now I am selecting only the brightest regions of the image, and then I'm going to drag down the highlight slider bar just to make them a little dimmer because they got somewhat blown out while raising the brightness of dimmer regions of the image. And that keeps those specific areas from being blown out in the course of editing. When done, the Photolab 8 edits are exported as another lossless TIFF, subtagged underscore DXO, to distinguish them from the edits done just in Affinity Photo. Back in Affinity Photo, the new adjusted layer is dragged back in. It has much better sharpness, much better color, and much better clarity. 
Now I'm going to use the curves tool to make a digital negative of this layer. The first inversion was just a test layer to see how good it might look, which is why that layer was called Invert 1. Now we're going to make the final inversion. I'll just drag the curves tool that I used to make the first inversion over the new image layer. Then I'll make the curves tool visible. Look how much better that looks. Now I'm going to merge visible to create a new inverted pixel layer. Now what I want to do is add this inversion back to the original layer. And my goal is to restore the beautiful color of the illuminated ionized parts of the flame nebula, while also incorporating the detail captured within the illuminated dark material that was revealed by the luminance polarity inversion. So what I'm going to do is just go up and down the Composites Options drop-down menu until I find the Composites option that appears to do the job best. I'll probably have to adjust it from there but I'm just going to look for the one that appears to do the job best. This one looks pretty interesting. The soft light composite mode is not quite what I want, but I do like what it's doing to the image. Let's experiment a little more and see what we can find. Affinity Photo offers a lot of composite modes, and both the hue and the saturation composite modes look very promising. The problem is, neither quite brings out as much detail as I am looking for in the dark material, so I think this is going to have to be a two-step compositing process. So now, what I'm going to do is look for a composite mode that further draws out the detail within the inverted image. And immediately, the luminosity composite mode appears to give what I'm looking for. I'm going to merge that layer and call it LRGB Invert 2. I'll make the previous inverted layer invisible, and then I'm going to composite that inverted layer over the LRGB information that was completed in Photolab 8. Wow, the color burn composite mode gives some amazing and beautiful results which Colorburn does, but it's not very useful. But applying the soft light composite mode to the Invert 2 layer does give what we're looking for. Look at that. We have much more illuminated dark material, brighter ionized material, though it's not overwhelming or blown out. And not only the yellows and oranges, but the weaker blues within the image are also enhanced. The soft light composite mode does that. It tends to improve both the color and the brightness of information within an image. It can draw down really hard on blacks, but since the inverted layer is a digital negative, there's not a lot of black there for it to pull down on. So rather, it incorporates the black to the whites in the layer that it was applied to, allowing the dark material to create definition and show up as shaded, but not turn so dark as to just turn into an almost black and dimensionless silhouette within the flame nebula. And this method allows us to illuminate the structure within the flame nebula, while staying absolutely true to the actual structure in the Flame Nebula, all of this information is what's really there. None of it's generated. We just altered it enough to be more visible to the human eye. Transforming the appearance of the LRGB information from this to this. This is what I want. Now I'm just going to export it back into Photolab 8 and color and light balance everything once again. The goal here is mainly going to be to enhance the contrast a little bit to help the detail show up and distinguish the structures within the flame nebulosity a bit better. Right now, the detail is obviously weak. That's why the image appears to have that overall white overcast, almost as if it were being observed through a fog. And the trick is going to be to increase the contrast to enhance the detail in the image while avoiding the loss of the subtle shades of dark information by having them once again lost in blackness because contrast just increases the difference between bright areas and dark areas. And the way around this is to use the local and tone adjustment tools to carefully balance the illumination of the center region where there is the strongest contrast between the bright areas and the dark areas. Then use Photolab 8's very powerful curves tool to gently enhance the difference between the dynamic range of the outer dimmer areas versus the inner areas. And I'll do that mostly on the luminosity channel so as not to affect the image's beautiful color. And then with the contrast and luminosity well balanced, I'll once again export this image back into Affinity Photo where the stars can be added back to the image. 
In Affinity Photo, I'll just drag in the new fully adjusted and edited Flame Nebula image beneath the star plate layers, and the stars will appear over the image. And now it's finished, giving us this final image. Now YouTube may not portray the subtle variations in color and shades within this image very well because YouTube is terrible for black crushing and over compressing images. If you want to see a more accurate portrayal of the image, just look at the link below in the description and follow it to the Sky Story Astro Bin where you can see the full res version there. But the thing to take note of within this image is that we have a much better view or perspective of the dark material within the Flame Nebula. The dark material is no longer merely silhouetted into obscurity. We can see that it has texture, thickness, depth, and dimension. And as I get an opportunity to add even more integration to this image, it will become further resolved and the primary flame nebula in the center and the surrounding material will become much sharper. I would imagine you might be wondering, but how do you know which composite modes to use? And I can only say that's years of practice. Now there are some good videos and articles that can help you understand Affinity Photo's many composite modes. In Affinity Photo, they're known as blend modes, but they tend to be very technical in their language and speak in ways that are difficult to follow, even myself, even though I've used Affinity Photo ever since there was an Affinity Photo. So in plain English, there are the multiply modes, which intensify colors, but always result in a darker image. There are the screen modes, which add light to light and result in a lighter, often paler image. There are the overlay modes that intensify color and brightness, but also increase contrast. There are the divide modes, which effectively extract or transform information. And there are the component modes, which affect hue, saturation, and luminosity. For astrophotographers, the luminosity composite mode is very important because it's the best way to composite luminance information to RGB information. Now, I play several musical instruments, and I find that learning the use of composite modes is a lot like playing a musical instrument, by which I mean you can study music theory and study and study and study. But until you pick up your fiddle and start practicing, you're not going to learn how to play it. It's as simple as that. And coming to understand and really be able to use the composite modes is a matter of practice and practice and more practice. Experiment with them, recombine them in different ways, add different tools and observe the effects and take note of what they do. As you do so, you'll develop an intuitive understanding of how to use which composite mode and in what ways and when. And I know all this takes a significant investment in time, but when you learn how to use composite modes, you can really accomplish some amazing things with it. I've used its composite modes to essentially reveal structures hidden within the dumbbell nebula, as in here. And as you saw within this video, reveal the subtle and fine structure of dark material within the flame nebula that would otherwise be hidden by the exceedingly bright contrasting ionized material around that darker material. And we haven't even gotten into the fact that each of these composite modes can be customized in the way they work, nor the fact that they can be intermixed in literally an infinite amount of ways between the various layers, meaning that the possibilities and power of compositing is about infinite. And that's one of the key reasons that I do all of my astrophotography editing in a layer-based non-destructive photo editor, in my case, Affinity Photo. I know this technique is advanced. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below. And thanks for watching, and I hope you learned something that you can apply to make your astrophotography better and better. Now, get out there and shoot that amazing sky.